Well, hello, and thank you for listening. There's a lot of fear about, isn't there? Uh, psychologists have coined a new term, a coronavirus anxiety. It's the heightened fear of illness and death made worse by home confinement, by reduced social interaction and very bleak wall-to-wall -wall TV coverage. According to a King's College London survey of over 2,000 adults published at the end of April, at least half of the UK population say that they're feeling anxious or depressed. There's an awful lot of fear about. But what are Christians to make of this? Should we be fearful in the sense that others fear? And what messages do we have for our friends, our neighbours and our family members who themselves tell us how fearful they are? Do we say, keep safe, don't worry about it, I'm sure you'll be all right? Well, they're nice words, but they do sound somewhat empty, don't they? Or how do we get to grips with fear? And not just the fear that we see in others, but our own anxiety, experienced perhaps on a day-to-day -day basis. I suppose that when people think about the teachings of Jesus, the thing that comes right to the front of their minds is Jesus' teaching about love. And it's true. Nowhere else it, throughout the whole world can we see such great teaching about what love is, who we should love and why we should love. But he, Jesus has an awful lot to say about fear. So today we're going to look at a great chapter, it's Luke chapter 12, and we're going to find that Jesus is going to teach us who we should fear most of all and why, and how the fear of God correctly understood liberates us from all anxiety. Now we're going to start by reading Luke chapter 12, the first 21 verses together. We're going to look at verses 23 to 34 later, but we'll just read this first section for the moment. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. 
for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now I wonder if you would please come back with me and look at verse 1. You'll see the chapter begins with Jesus. And there's a great crowd. So many, Luke tells us, that they're trampling on each other. But Jesus turns from the crowd and starts speaking to his disciples. And he makes a really striking statement. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Well, that's quite an opener, isn't it? But everything has a context. And the context of these words is back in chapter 11. In chapter 11, verse 37, Jesus is having dinner with a Pharisee. The Pharisee expresses astonishment that Jesus didn't conform with the tradition of washing before dinner. And this triggers a series of, frankly, blood-curdling denunciations from Jesus. You Pharisees, in verse 39, you're more interested in the outside what things look like when on the inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You crave the admiration and the respect of men in verse 43. But you give little regard to what God thinks of you. Now as a result of all of that, and that was just a summary of it, Jesus is a marked man in verses 53 and 54 at the end of Luke chapter 11. The scribes of the Pharisees, they're lying in wait for him. They're trying to catch him. They become his enemies. And because they sit on the Jewish ruling council, they are powerful enemies. Enemies to be feared. Well, that's one of the reasons why the words of Jesus here in our chapter are so wonderful. Because the man who teaches us about fear and anxiety, the man who is like us in every way. This man had every human reason himself to be full of fear and anxiety. So that's the context. Let's come back to, chapter, to verse 1. Notice what Jesus does not say. He doesn't say, beware of the Pharisees. He says, beware of the leaven, the yeast of the Pharisees. In other words, beware of their thinking. Beware of their viewpoint. They're not interested in the heart. They're interested in rules. They're happy to wash the outside while the inside, the bit that mattered, is dirty. And Jesus calls that way of thinking hypocrisy. Now the word, our English word, hypocrite, comes from the old Greek word for actor, or more literally, mask wearer. Let me explain. In Jesus' day, Greek actors used different masks depending on what character they were playing. But it's like Jesus is saying, God's not interested in acting or the mask that you are wearing, because he looks straight behind the mask, into our hearts. So beware of this mask wearing, this play acting, this leaven. It's poisonous, it spreads insidiously. Beware of it. 
And one day, if you look at verses 3 and 4, Jesus makes it clear that these masks are going to be stripped away. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, he says, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. It will all come out one day. The Pharisees sought the respect of men and not the pleasure of God. That will come out. They backchatted and they whispered. And that will come out. All will be revealed. Nothing will be hidden. It will all come out. And look at verses 4 and 5 because here Jesus really puts his finger on the problem. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. It's like Jesus is saying, look, the Pharisees are powerful, but they have no authority over your eternal future. But God does. Fear him. And if you wish to be released from the fear of others or from life's day-to-day anxieties, you must learn to fear God first because it's an essential precondition to being released from the fear of everything else. Look how Jesus continues. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even all the hairs on your head are numbered. Fear not, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Now Jesus is saying, look, just think about the market. Just think how cheap you can buy a sparrow for. Uh, You may think they're inconsequential, one of the most, uh, the cheapest and most common foodstuffs. But God knows every single one of them. Apparently the uh, human hair, head, averages about 100,000 hairs. 150,000 if you're blonde, 80,000 if you're redhead. But whether you're blonde or dark or red, you can't count them. And what does it matter if a few hairs fall out? Now forgive me, if you're balding, um, to you it may matter that a few more hairs have just fallen out, but Jesus' point is that every hair, everything, is significant to God. He's numbered every single hair, so fear not, do not worry. Now, let's hit the pause button, because I wonder if we've missed the argument that Jesus is making here. You see, we may have expected Jesus to say, don't worry about people like the Pharisees who can kill you. Don't be afraid of them. After all, God values you. He knows every hair on your head. Fear not. That's not what he said, is it? Instead, he has challenged us to get our priorities right. We cannot celebrate the fear not in verse 7 unless we have first got to grips with the fear him in verse 5. There's a hierarchy of fear here. There's a priority of fear. Fear him comes first, then fear not. So what does it mean to fear God? Well, we can begin by saying that throughout Scripture, the people of God are characterised as those who fear God. And it's not a cowering, whimpering, run away from God type fear. In France, where we live, we know some ex-farmers. They used to have a hunting dog. And like many French farmers, uh, the dogs were kicked and beaten and they were kept in a cage. And whenever the farmer calls the dog, it cowers and it slinks away. That's not what it means to fear God. The fear of God is a conscious understanding that God looks on my heart. Nothing is hidden from him. 
I might be able to hide my sinful habits from others, but there isn't a mask in the world that can stop God seeing me as I really am. He made me. He sustains me. I am accountable to him and I will fear him. The leaven of the Pharisees was mask wearing. It elevated the outside, the things others can see. Above the inside, my thought life, my motives, the things that God can see. Well, the Apostle Paul used to be a Pharisee. He had a lot to say about the sinfulness of men and women in Romans chapters 2 and 3. And he brings this great long list of quotations from the Old Testament to make his point. None is righteous, he said. Mouths are full of curses and bitterness. Feet are swift to shed blood. We tread the paths of ruin and misery. But as Paul brings his arguments to a climax, to a climax, summarising our human condition, wanting to get to the very heart of the things that really is wrong with us, he quotes from Psalm 36 and he says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Dear brothers and sisters, there, in the end, there are only two things to fear. We either fear God or we can fear everything else. So Jesus starts here, fear him, fear God, who has authority over your eternal destiny. We cannot celebrate the fear not unless we have first got to grips with the fear him. Now as Jesus continues through the chapter, I want us to see three things how a proper understanding of what it is to fear God then shapes our character and shapes the way we live our lives. And the first thing I want to say is in verses 8 to 12, and I'm going to be very brief on this point, but it's an important point. The fear of God results in a bold confession of Christ. Look at verses 8 and 9. And I tell you, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Now, can you see the fear God, fear not link here? If we fear God, we are released from the fear of men. We are able to acknowledge Christ before men and do so with boldness. Do we lack boldness to confess Christ to others? We often do, don't we? And we need to pray for boldness. But sometimes we forget that the fear him bit comes before the fear not. Sometimes we need to understand that our, the boldness that we receive to speak to Christ of others is rooted in our prior acknowledgement that the, the God of heaven and earth has authority over us. At the beginning of the Reformation in uh, April 1521, Martin Luther was appeared to, uh, ordered to appear before the Diet of Worms. Uh, it's always made me snigger ever since I've been a child, uh, but Worms is a town on the Rhine. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V was presiding, and the prosecutor was a man called Johann Eck. Luther had been charged as a heretic, a crime for which there were very serious consequences, probably his death. Johann Eck laid out copies of Luther's writings on a table and asked him if the books were his and whether he stood by their contents. Luther confirmed that he was their author and requesting time to speak with his friends, he returned the next day and declared, I am bound by the scriptures. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything. May God help me. Luther feared God 
not men. The fear him came before the fear not. Well, there's much more that I could say about that point, and perhaps I ought to say it, but we need to move on. The first point I want to make, the fear of God results in a bold confession of Christ. Secondly, the fear of God reorders our perspectives. And I'm now looking particularly at verses 13 to 21. Because someone throws a curved ball at Jesus. A man in the crowd shouts out, tell my brother to share the inheritance. It's a question about money, which Jesus doesn't get involved with. But he then proceeds with this very famous parable of the rich fool. There's a rich man. And he's doing rather well. His land produces a bumper crop. So he starts investing in new, bigger barns. And before long, he has got so much stuff that he says, relax, eat, drink, be merry. That he had forgotten something. God required his soul of him. And God called him an utter fool. Now, among other things, can you see that Jesus is giving us here a very powerful example of the fear of God in practice? What was this man's fatal error? If you look at verse 17, he thinks to himself. It's a nice way of putting it, isn't it? That God's out of the picture. There's no regard here for the God of heaven and earth who blessed him with this great harvest in the first place. There's no thought of thanksgiving. He said, what will I do with my crops? Jesus's withery assessment is that the man was laying up treasure for himself and was not rich toward God. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Well, I want you to see, though, is that when we do fear God, it reorders our perspectives. The God-fearing man doesn't think, think to himself. God isn't out of the picture. He's not out of the frame. He's very much in the picture when it comes to plans and decisions. And the God-fearing man also knows that everything that he has has been given to him by the Lord. His world viewpoint isn't, oh, why haven't I got so much stuff? I can take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. The man who fears God is rich towards God. And Jesus will make it clear later in the chapter. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. My dear brothers and sisters, there is not a spreadsheet in the world or a personal financial advisor in the world that can total up heavenly treasure. The greatest possible treasure, of course, is to have Christ. And what a, what a treasure that is. Uh, to see him and to enjoy him forever. To have Christ. He's my greatest treasure. And because he waits for me in heaven, where my treasure is, that is where my heart will be also. But the rich man had got it all wrong, hadn't he? Rich in this life, but his soul was required of him. And then who's, all the things that he had, where were they going to go? They weren't going with him, were they? And in the end, Jesus' assessment of this rich man is the same as his assessment of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were fools. Jesus had told the Pharisees, did not he who made the outside make the inside also fools? And the rich man was also a fool. He lived and he acted as God wasn't there. The rich man and the Pharisees, they were fools together. There was no fear of God before their eyes. So the fear of God results in a bold confession of Christ and the fear of God reorders our perspectives. And my third point is that the fear of God releases us from anxiety. And this is where we want to look at verses 22 and 34. And I'm just going to read, let's just read them together. 
starting at verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And if then you're not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Beautiful words. But come back to me, uh, come back with me to verse 22. Do not be anxious, Jesus says. What you will eat, nor about your body, what you'll put on, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. And just scan down there to verse 29. Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. I can't do justice to this passage here, but I do want to highlight a few obvious points. The first point is that God values us. Fear not, you're of more value than many sparrows. In verse 7 and verse 24, consider the ravens, how much more value are you? Now, I wonder if you're thinking, and I've thought this often in the past, well, how does that translate? Is the argument that I am to be free from anxiety because I'm valued more than sparrows? Well, that isn't the point that Jesus is making, is it? If you think about it. And it comes back to the fear of God. As I fear God, I know he looks straight into my heart. He sees me as I really am, selfish, sinful. And if I'm really honest, that hypocritical leaven of the Pharisees where I'm more gratified by the admiration of men than by the pleasure of God. How often does that lurk inside my own heart as well? And as I fear God, I not only recognise that I'm a sinful man, but that that God that I fear has authority over my eternal destiny. But what Jesus is saying, despite the truth of all of that, he assures me that God values me. He has not treated me as my sins deserve. He is my loving Heavenly Father. I am his child. He cares for me. Fear not. God values us. Second, we do not fear because he knows our need. Look at verse 29. Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Don't be worried. Not about the big things. 
not about the little things. You can leave others to do that. The nations of the world are very good at getting stressed and anxious, but you have a Father in heaven and he knows what you need, every need, and before you need it. But maintain your priorities. Seek the kingdom, everything else will follow. First fear God, then fear not. Get your priorities right, everything will be added. Fear not, he values us. Fear not, he knows our needs. And thirdly here, fear not, he delights in us. Look at verse 32, such a beautiful verse this. You know, brothers and sisters, God has something very, very special for those that fear him. What does Jesus say? Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Can you feel the utter gentleness and graciousness of those words? Just think about it. Not for us, it, the denunciation that Jesus levelled at the, at the Pharisees. Not the heavenly verdict, you fool. No, what is Jesus doing? He's reminding us. We are his flock and we have a shepherd, the good shepherd. The shepherd who cares for us, who tends us, who is gentle with us, who understands us, who understands and empathises, in, including when we're anxious. The shepherd who sought us out when we were lost and the good shepherd who lays down his life for us. Fear not, little flock. And we have a father. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's. Good pleasure. We have a father who loves his children. Not just a shepherd and not just a father. We also have a king who has a kingdom and who will, without fail, give us his kingdom. Shepherd, father, king. And it is our father's good pleasure to do all of that. You know, all my Christian life, I've, well, frankly, I've never understood why it is my father's good pleasure to give me his kingdom. What is it, what is it about me? Well, the answer, of course, is that there is nothing about me. Nothing I've done, nothing I've avoided doing, nothing I've said, nothing I've avoided saying. No. This is all about the father's good pleasure and it's to the praise of his glorious grace and it's just another reason why we not only praise him but we fear his holy name it is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom well you know we need to come to an end but i wonder what we make of all of this stuff I can't really think of many other areas where Jesus' teaching stands in such a stark contrast to our current culture. Think about it. Our culture says the remedy for coronavirus is to pull together, to stay safe. Together we can beat it. There'll be a vaccine soon. Well, I hope and pray there is. But the God of heaven and earth, who gives all life, has been squeezed out of the picture. God doesn't get much of a look in, does he? Worldwide pandemic or not, the leaven of the Pharisees has permeated nearly every TV and radio programme that we watch. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Later on in Luke's Gospel, we read of three men being crucified. One of them is Jesus, the Lord of all glory. And the other two men, well, they're just criminals. The first criminal throws abuse at Jesus. But the second criminal rebukes the first. Do you not fear God, he said. You're about to die. Your lifespan can be measured in minutes and seconds. 
Do you not fear God? There's something disbelieving and incredulous about that question, isn't there? Do you not fear God? Really? Well, I think there are times when our friends ne need to hear the same question asked of them. They're afraid. They wonder what's going on in, with the world. Do you not fear God? Because, my friends, he holds your life in his hands now and he has authority over your eternal destiny. Do you not fear God? Now, please don't imagine for a moment that I think it's easy to do that. It's not. It's very, very hard to, be, to have the wisdom when to say those words and to ask that question. But remember what happened next to the dying criminal. He turned to Christ and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And we know the answer. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. And it's like the gospel in a sentence. It's as simple as that. Call on his name, moved by holy fear, and you will be saved. How do we get to grips with fear? Jesus is teaching us that we can never do that unless we start with a fear of God. As Christians, we do not put our trust in politicians. We do not put our trust in scientists. We do not even put our trust in vaccines. We put our trust in the Lord. And as we fear him, then the words of Jesus echo back to us. Fear not, little flock, for it is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen. I'm just going to pray. Would you pray with me? Father, the psalmist said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the sea, we will not fear. Father, we live in difficult days. Many people are in fear. And we pray that you would give us opportunity and the words to speak and the wisdom and the love to do it, to say to our friends and family members who are not yet Christians. Please, Lord, will you use this pandemic as a day of salvation and grace. Please, Lord, that people will be moved by a holy fear that they may call upon your name and be saved and that they also with us may hear the words of Jesus, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Thank you, Father, in the name of your Son. Amen.